All right, welcome back, everybody. So today we're going to be brewing a good old German Hefeweizen, a uh, heavy wheat beer, if you will. So these are very famous beers, uh, originated in Bavaria. Um, many fine commercial examples are out there, uh, especially those that are brewed by breweries in Munich and uh, southern places in southern Germany. But um, anyway, I uh, this is going to be my third time, actually, I think, trying to brew a decent wheat beer. Um, I have had issues in the past where uh, I just get really awful efficiencies with wheat malt and it turns out that um, like my gravities would be 20 points lower than they were supposed to. Seriously bad stuff. Uh, so, so I'm going to chalk that up to me probably not really knowing too much about what I was even doing uh, when I was trying to do all grain for the first time, uh, brewing in a bag and uh, not really being sure of how the malts would behave I guess. Um, now it has been a solid year since I attempted uh, doing any sort of wheat beer, so hopefully it works out today. If it doesn't, I don't know, it's not just my brewing, it's uh, actually something to do with malts and uh, the efficiencies that I'm going to need to work on. But anyway, so this is going to be the second time that I'm brewing with this setup of the uh, the Mega Pot and the Hot Rod Heat Stick, um, uh, and last time I actually got ridiculously high efficiency, so I'm going to hope that maybe that'll be enough uh, to solve that, that efficiency issue, but I don't know, time will tell. Uh, the recipe we're going to use is pretty simple and straightforward. It's just uh, five pounds each of wheat malt and Munich malt, and then half a pound of melanoidin malt. Um, most people are going to be wondering why I'm using Munich malt instead of like Pilsner um, or uh, or Turo or something you know light like that. Well, actually, it's because I'm trying to really clone the beefy, chewy flavor of a uh, a really well done Hefeweizen. So. So I'm like shooting for something that's kind of in the middle between a, uh, a Hefeweizen and a Dunkelweizen, which is a darker, more maltier, uh, kind of has a lot of Munich malt in it kind of version of a Hefeweizen. So, however, that usually has like things like Special B and uh, Cara Munich and other things, but I'm just shooting for a straight up wheat beer here. Uh, nothing too complex in the malt bill, but I'm, I'm curious to see what some Munich does. We'll be using an ounce of Palatau uh, for a single 60 minute bettering edition. And then we'll be using the Y-Yeast 3068 Weinstefan Wheat. That's apparently the strain that the, uh, the Weinstefan or brewery actually uses for their wheat beers. So they make excellent, uh, excellent wheat beers. So I'm gonna go ahead and hope that this one works. Um, I brewed with it before and it, it tastes pretty good. So. Anyway, yeah, it's a smack pack, single smack pack, should be enough for five gallons of what we're doing, um, since it's not a very high gravity. So the first step is uh, gonna be just doing simple brew in the bag, single infusion mash um, at 152 degrees, right in the middle of the road. Um, that should give us a nice and a balanced uh, body as well as fermentability, so hopefully that works out. So we just hit our uh, straight water temperature of 158 degrees, so without uh, further ado, I'm gonna pull the heat stick out and we're gonna throw in. In case anyone is actually wondering, I did heat the strike water using only the heat stick, not the actual burner element, so that way I can just keep the pot on the stove. Um, so that way I can just put the insulation and everything on it without taking it off the stove, which is really uh, a great help because this pot is actually very heavy. Here we go, it's uh, 151.5, okay, that'll be fine. So the mash is complete. It's been about 90 minutes now. So we're gonna take a little temperature reading real quick and see what happened. All right, so um, yeah, lost a lot of temperature actually on this. It's, uh, it's reading 144. That's not actually awesome. Um, 
that's mainly because I took the kettle off of, uh, normally when I um, am actually doing the brew in the bag, normally I will sit this on a cushion or other um, kind of like insulating surface on the bottom um, and then wrap it up as I did already. However, I didn't do that this time. I didn't expect heat to be lost through the bottom, but I guess it was. Um, I suppose next time I can keep a very low heat on the burner, perhaps, and see if that works. Uh, otherwise, um, I'll just go back to putting it on the cushion. Um, anyway, it's still going to be fine, um, and if anything, we'll have a little more fermentability. But uh, this might be a pretty um, thin-bodied half but I don't know. We'll see what happens. Anyway, I uh, still should get a good brew out of it, so hopefully that works. boil obviously uh, so now it's time to add the bittering hop edition the only one that we have today uh, which is this the one ounce of Hallertau local fruit so <clears throat> all right so our estimated um, pre-boil OG was 1.036 our actual pre-boil OG reading came in, and that is uh, 1.034. I don't know if you can see this, um, but yeah, basically, that's huge news, and that's awesome for me because that means that I finally got a good mash with wheat malt. So the answer to that problem is not that the malt is bad; it's that I was mashing wrong before, um, and it makes sense. So anyway, yeah, the more you do this, the more you learn, the better you get at it. So hopefully, this brew goes along just about as well as it started. Um, so far, not starting too badly. All right, so now it's 15 minutes from the end of the boil. We're gonna add our chiller as usual. And the second thing we're gonna add is yeast nutrients. So um, this is enough for five gallons. Um, basically just kind of dead yeast cells and stuff. They basically encourage healthy fermentation. I started to get into the habit of just kind of adding this in as a catch-all. That's a good thing to, to make a habit in your brain. So there we go, hopefully it doesn't explode. So you'll notice I didn't actually toss roll flock into this particular beer, um, and that's mainly because Hefeweizens are a uh, classically unfiltered style. So unlike other German beers, um, Hefeweizens do not get lagered. They don't get stored cold and uh, clarified via the process of lagering. So I don't need to worry about beer clarity, so I'm just not going to toss roll flock in. I'm going to save that uh, tablet for another beer. Now if I was brewing a type of uh, wheat beer known as a Crystal Weizen, uh, that is, in fact, actually clarified and clear. So, in that case, yes, I would throw a roll flock tablet in, but we're not going to be doing that just yet. As usual, while we're cooling down, I'm going to talk about the fermentation of the beer. So, Hefeweizen yeast generally kicks out two uh, primary flavors. So, one of them is an ester, and one of them is a phenol. The ester is the banana flavor um, that generally people associate with Hefeweizens, and the phenol is like a spicy kind of clovey flavor. So, basically, one of these is going to be dominant over the other unless you ferment it at a very specific temperature. So if you tend to go on, and that's totally fine, if you want to have a beer that has a lot more clove flavor or a lot more banana flavor in it than the other, then you know more power to you. But basically, if you ferment on the low end of the spectrum, so we're talking 60 degrees or less, you're gonna get a lot of clove flavor. Um, that is where the phenol becomes more strong than the ester. Now, if you take the opposite of that and go up past 65 to 70 to higher than that, you'll get a banana flavor and that comes from that ester. No matter what you choose to do, uh, just understand that one of these flavors is probably going to be dominant than the other and it's a lot easier to accidentally warm ferment your beer too hard and you get what's known as a banana bomb <laughs> or a hefeweizen that tastes like you're basically drinking a banana flavored milkshake or something. 
Um, unless that's what you're going for, so cool. Uh, I'm not. I am going to ferment this at a very strict 62 degrees, if I can manage it. Um, I'm going to try to keep my apartment down to about 62. Uh, I'm trying to keep it consistent that way for two-ish weeks. Our original gravity sample is in, and it's exactly 1.050 which is awesomeness. Considering our estimated original gravity was actually supposed to be 1.049, this is awesome. It is right on target and 100% um, very happy with it. So uh, that's always a good thing to see. Uh, anyway, the wort is cooled down now, so I should be able to pitch the yeast pretty quickly. So as you can see, I have a massive fermenter uh, right now. That is five gallons of wort in um, a seven gallon fermenter. Um, unfortunately, the Homebrew store did not sell a uh, smaller wide mouth uh, carboy, so that's what we got. Um, but that's totally fine for a beer like this, where we're not going to be storing it for an extended period of time, and uh, we're not going to have um, like oxygenation problems to really worry about. Um, also, wheat beers do tend to have the extremely violent fermentations, so having that little bit of extra headspace in there is actually good because that means that we're not going to deal with. Um, needing a blow off tube or something like that. Alright, and uh, one other awesome thing about the wide mouth fermenter is that I don't have to shake it to aerate it, I can just stick my whole hand in there and go. Alright, sanitized, swollen, smack pack, out of pitch. Now, basically, we will just keep this somewhere and uh, let it go and do its thing for two weeks at 62 degrees. So the Hefeweizen fermentation did go pretty well, all things considered. Um, I did lower my apartment down to 62, but that is one explosive fermentation, and man did it kick off some heat. My thermometer that's strapped to the edge of the fermenter was reading up to 68 at points uh, during the fermentation because it was so hot and it was throwing off that much heat. So that's just something to keep in mind that the fermentation activity, mainly the primary stage, will increase the temperature inside of your fermenter up to like five or six degrees above your ambient room temperature, uh, depending on how active that fermentation actually is. All right, so our final gravity sample is in, uh, and here we have a final gravity of about 1.008 uh, specific gravity. So that puts us at great attenuation, somewhere along the lines of uh, about five and a half-ish percent alcohol, so right on target as to what we're looking for. I did sample this, and so far the flavor is uh, not really unexpected, which is good. Um, pretty heavy on the clove, but I like that. That's personally what I was going for. Um, not really too much of a banana bomb here, but uh, we have um, a little bit of yeast sharpness that'll go away in time. Um, but at the moment, I'm actually lacking that whole um, very thick, bready character I was kind of going for uh, by adding Munich malt. But perhaps that's just a function of time. Anyway, it's still a pretty great Hefeweizen, even if it doesn't have a huge amount of breadiness in it. Um, and uh, it's only going to get better as the flavors round out, and perhaps, you know, that will become more apparent over time. So, we'll see. All right, so we're back now. It's uh, It's been about two weeks, a little over actually, uh, that the beer has been in the bottle. Uh, it's been conditioned, it's fully carbonated. The flavor is right where it needs to be. It's gotten rid of all of that kind of green, new, fresh beer flavor. Um, the yeast sharpness that I was talking about before is gone. So I think it's ready to, to taste and truly actually analyze. So the final beer is here and um, I've titled it Bavarian Bliss. It came out to about 5.7% alcohol by volume and uh, a very small nine IBUs, uh, but that is totally characteristic of the style. As far as metrics go, that's about exactly what we want. So right as I was about to shoot the segment where I poured the beer, I noticed that the glass I was using was actually kind of dirty, so I figured uh, it'd be best to use a fresh and guaranteed clean glass. So here I pulled out my uh, my pride and joy here, the Weinstefaner Hefeweizen glass. Uh, this is one of my favorite beer glasses actually, it's just a very nice design and uh, quite a joy to look at and drink from. But I think it's fitting because I use the Weinstefan wheat yeast in this beer anyway, so why not use the Weinstefan glass to taste it? So, so anyway, here we go. Decent level of carbonation.
All right, so as you can see, um, I did dump all the yeast in there. That's kind of something you do when you uh, have a Hefeweizen. Uh, it's kind of a traditional thing. All right, so the color, as you can see, is uh, quite dark for a Hefeweizen, uh, and that is due to the Munich malt. Uh, it is somewhere along the lines of a dark gold to almost bronze color, I would say. Um, so here you can see it up in the light, just so you can, I don't know if that's actually in frame, but hopefully it is. Head, uh, the head is a nice pillowy, very uh, nice white color, uh, very fine bubbles, and um, it stays put pretty well actually too. It's got uh, a decent amount of head retention. That is a natural characteristic of wheat malt, uh, which is one of the awesome things about Hefeweizen is you get this glorious head. Uh, so next up, of course, is aroma. Ah, there's something super refreshing about the smell of good Hefeweizen. So this has a very classic, classic German Hefeweizen smell. This aroma brings back some memories of uh, a great, fantastic little German beer bar that was in my college town. And uh, every time we would go down there, I'd usually order a wheat beer at some point during the evening. And it came out and it always smelled glorious like this. Uh, there's such a nice, healthy helping of wheat malt with uh, a balanced clove aroma that um, does not smell overpowering at all. It's just, uh, it smells just spicy and and, uh, and savory and just full. It smells very full. Uh, it's a fantastic aroma. This this thing just smells great. So um, next we'll go to the, uh, the body of the beer. So the wheat malt in here makes this have a very creamy mouthfeel. Uh, that being said, the body of it is somewhat thin, um, but that's all right. It's it's not meant to be a very heavy beer. It's not meant to be super thick, chewy. Um, I think the body is actually honestly where it should be. It's uh, it's something that you can drink very easily, very quickly. Um, but it's uh, something I definitely want to enjoy. It's a, uh, a nice, pleasant effervescence with a carbonation right on point. I did about 2.75 volumes of CO2 um, for carbonation, and it has just enough to kind of spritz your tongue, and uh, not so much that it kind of stings your tongue like a soda, for example. Um, but it's it's high. It's a little more highly carbonated than uh, than most standard beers out there. Uh, however, that kind of lends to its uh, that plays off of the clove quite quite nicely, I think personally. So as far as flavor goes, um, there's a little bit of banana, a little bit, uh, but not much, actually. I think the dominant flavor here did turn out to be the clove. Um, that being said, having put that on a background of Munich malt, which is a much breadier, a much fuller kind of flavored malt than simple wheat malt uh, or Pilsner malt, uh, that actually works really well. So like previously in this video, I mentioned when I took an early sample that I didn't think it had a good bready character to it, but uh, that has indeed changed with time. The time in the bottle made that so much nicer. It is smooth and it is ready and it's got just a very nice balance of malt and clove. So this is actually quite low on the fruity esters, which um, I'm pretty happy about. That normally happens to me. I normally get more fruity flavor and since it went up to 68, I was a little concerned that I would get a little more banana flavor, but honestly, this thing has delivered, and uh, this is a great advice, and I finally was able to brew one that turned out as I designed, so that's very nice. So yeah, it's a, I definitely will use the Munich malt in this again, I think, instead of the Pilsner malt. It is a fantastic go-to beer. Uh, it's got a great turnaround time. Uh, I actually brewed this less than a month ago, and uh, it's ready to go now, so um, definitely will brew this again. Definitely will use the Munich malt again. And uh, overall, just a fantastic little beer. So I'm very happy with this. As you know, I love my European styles. All right, that about wraps up the end of this video here. Thanks for sticking around to the end. If you decide to brew this beer, please let me know in the comments below. If you have any other comments, questions, concerns, etc., also feel free to drop those down in the comments as long as they are civil. If you like this video, if you like watching me do what I do, please consider dropping a like or a subscribe. Uh, both of those things really do help my channel out quite a bit. To my current subscribers, thank you for continuing to be awesome. I've enjoyed the dialogue that I've been having with many of you. So without further ado, I'm going to continue. 
uh, finishing off this lovely beer, and uh, I will catch you in the next one. So, Prost!